This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. 265 million. That's the number of people expected to face acute hunger, as the coronavirus crisis could trigger a pandemic of hunger. This according to a new United Nations report. The study, released Tuesday, says the number of severely hungry people worldwide will nearly double by the end of this year, due to the impact of the spread of COVID-19. On Tuesday, the head of the World Food Program warned the world will see multiple famines of biblical proportions if swift action isn't taken. The crisis is projected to disproportionately affect Africa, where there's already widespread hunger. In South Sudan, a food crisis affected more than 60 percent of the population last year. Now, with the coronavirus, reports of growing desperation are laying bare rampant inequality across the continent. In South Africa, which is under strict lockdown as the African nation with the most reported COVID-19 cases, there's reportedly a food Food crisis in Cape Town, as the ongoing lockdown has left informal workers who've lost their livelihoods with little relief. There are also reports of growing panic about hunger in Nigeria. This is a resident of Lagos, Nigeria's largest city. If this coronavirus did not kill people with disability, definitely this hunger of stay at home will kill people. Because let me tell you, most of my people. They don't eat. This comes as the World Health Organization estimates the number of COVID-19 cases in Africa could rise to 10 million in the next three to six months. The New York Times reports public hospitals in 41 countries across Africa have less than 2,000 ventilators, 10 African countries do not have a single ventilator. For more, we're going to London, where we're joined by Kumi Naidu, the former secretary general of Amnesty International, former head of Greenpeace. He's a lifelong South African human rights activist and climate justice activist, was the first African to head Greenpeace. Kumi, welcome back to Democracy Now! As you hear those figures um, about Africa and particularly what's happening in your country of South Africa, where decades ago you were um, a very well-known anti-apartheid activists, as you started your activism right through to today. Talk about what Africa faces. I think this is an extremely terrifying and frightening moment for the people of Africa. Uh, it's important to note that that report that was released by the World Food Programme was already saying to the world that in 2020, we were already facing a major food crisis. That was before the coronavirus hit. Now we're looking at a situation where the report says that we could be looking at about 300,000 deaths per day over a three-month period. Now, the reality for Africa is that before even the coronavirus hits, this is what we are dealing with. We're dealing with healthcare systems that are not strong, we're dealing with a population that has high levels of vulnerability because of the high levels of HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, um, and malaria. Uh, and we're looking at economies that are actually really struggling. So right now, uh, I think we are in a very vulnerable state as African continent, and we hope that international solidarity will be there to help our people get through this very bumpy ride ahead of us. And, and Kumi, I, I'm wondering if you could talk about the impact, especially on the most populous nations uh, in Africa, uh, Egypt, uh, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and of course, South Africa, where you are. The um, the question of the increasing globalization and urbanization of the world has led to these giant mega cities, uh, even in Africa, where a virus like the coronavirus can spread much more rapidly. Uh, Amy mentioned South Sudan, uh, a country of 11 million people. It's got it's got more vice presidents, five vice presidents, than it has ventilators. It only has four ventilators in the whole country. What? Uh, uh, how can these, especially large countries with these huge urban populations, cope? And what lessons do they have, for instance, uh, in Uganda, which Uganda has a massive public health program that's already uh, spreading out, trying to identify potential hotspots in their country? Well, I think that. The positive news is that the extent of how fast the virus has moved through the African continent has not been as devastating as it was in Europe. 
So when we look at the situation in South Africa, for example, the interventions that have been made by the South African government have really been to actually ensure in the first instance that we prevent deaths, but to actually buy time for when the pandemic peaks so that during this time we ramp up on PPE, we ramp up on um, testing, uh, field hospitals and so on. So that's what's being planned. Right now, as we stand, the level of uh, loss of human life in the African continent compared to Europe or the US, for example, is still painful, but, but, but you know, like South Africa, for example, the number is still under, under 100 deaths. So the preparedness, though, the preparedness of African countries, if we have a situation like what we had in New York, in terms of ventilators, equipment, uh, trained personnel, and so on, is going to be pretty devastating. So that's why I think, you know, the efforts now that are being made by individual African countries, but also by the African Union, needs to be generously supported. Because for many people in Africa right now, the choice is almost also between if you want a pandemic that's a health pandemic or a hunger pandemic. And as many people are saying, you know, if we don't get killed by COVID-19, we'll get killed by hunger. And so balancing this is going to be a very tricky act of leadership. But what we hope is that we have a mentality uh, in terms of how we think we need to build the continent forward is not to build back exactly what we had, which shows all these vulnerabilities. We have to learn from this so that we are building in a way that we address the climate crisis, we address inequality, we address uh, maldistribution of budgetary resources and so on. And Kumi Naidu, the price of oil <laughs> dropping um, below zero for the first time ever Monday. The historic collapse due to this historic lack of demand, as the many in the world um, are told to shelter at home. What are the implications of this? And we just have a minute or two. Well, the one sort of short-term positive, if you want, uh, impact is that emissions have actually reduced drastically. And um, the fact that um, the scale of the impact has been so much, and the fact that people have responded in most countries with such urgency and also, you know, uh, ensuring that they're taking the painful actions of being in lockdown. By the way, I'm not in South Africa. I'm locked down in London at the moment, waiting to try and get to South Africa. Uh, so given the fact that people have taken all of these efforts shows that there is a greater capability within the people of our planet to take the big actions that we need to take to address the other challenges that have been with us for so long. The, the, the major problem right now, we have to be conscious that, as we saw with the United States after 9-11 and the Patriot Act, that was a special reduction in civil liberties and so on. But we see that even though 9-11 is behind us, many of those elements still remain. One of the concerns we must have is that we want to be very clear that as citizens, we are supporting what our governments are doing in this moment of crisis. But we also need to ensure that we do not have a situation where immediately after this, most of those measures remain in place. So we have to understand the crisis that we're in is a multifaceted crisis. It's a crisis of poverty, hunger, human rights, uh, and, of course, climate and environment. And let's be clear that if we don't address environmental degradation, the situation that we have now with the spread of viruses, as health professionals have been warning us, will continue. Forests and other ecological assets help prevent the flow of viruses and so on. And right now, humanity must take a hard look at our, ourselves about whether we want to build back after corona exactly what we had or we want to build back a more equitable, more just, just and a more sustainable world. Kumi Naidu, we want to thank you for being with us, former Secretary General of Amnesty International, previously the head of Greenpeace, lifelong South African human rights and climate justice activist.